Okay, let me just share this with y'all. Uh, this was posted uh, on Blackboard in the usual spot. So this is the review for module four. Okay, so um, those of you that are in my 3 p.m. discussion, we basically did a lot of this stuff on Tuesday, so we're just basically reviewing some more. Um, so for the first question here, it says to use implicit differentiation to find the tangent line to the given curve at the given point. Oh, also a note. Um, You'll keep getting reminders about that, uh, like course review or what do y'all have to fill out, like course evaluations. So please do that. <laughs> you can't see my screen? Oh, no, I can't either. That's weird. Oh, here we go. Allow. Uh huh. Oh, just took a while. Hi, Miss Moreno. Okay, good. All right. So, so graph sketching will be like something um, like we give you a graph of the derivative and then ask you to come up with a possible graph for the original function f. Okay. So let's use implicit differentiation here to find the tangent line to the given curve at the given point, all right? So the idea here is that we're thinking of y as a function of f. <laughs> the mayor, mayor's still busy. She couldn't, she couldn't make it, but she gives her best. Um, she, she wishes you all the best of luck on the module. All right. So when we take the derivative, we're basically going to differentiate this whole equation with respect to x. If if the term is just purely in, ter uh, in terms of x, then you just differentiate it the usual way. If it has a y variable, then you think of y as a function of x, and you'll use a chain rule. OK? So I'm going to take the derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to x. OK, so what would be the derivative of x to the fourth? Uh huh. Okay, now the term x squared y, when I take the derivative of that, it'll be a little more complicated because I'm thinking about y as a function of x. Okay, so, so what do we think? So take a moment, um, but tell us what you think the derivative here will be. So we've got 2xy plus y prime x squared. So yes, that, that's correct. So it's minus, and then the derivative of x squared y, you'll use the product rule, which first tells us to take the derivative of x squared, which gives us 2x, and we leave the y. Then we add, leave x squared by itself, and take the derivative of y, which you can write down as y prime or dy over dy. Okay, now what's the derivative of y to the fourth? 4y cubed times y prime. Yeah, exactly. So you take the derivative, you're, you're kind of thinking of it as a chain rule here. You take the derivative of the outside function, which is y to the fourth. So that means you bring the four down and reduce the exponent by one. And then the inside function is like y, and the derivative of y is just y prime. Okay, and what's the derivative of 1? Perfect. All 
OK? If I want to use um, implicit differentiation to find the tangent line at the point negative 1, 1, I can just plug in negative 1 and 1. Right? I don't need to solve for y prime to answer this question. Um, I am going to ask, but let, let's just do it anyway just to see how you can do it. And it can help. Um, it can also help in other cases. If they ask you, like, where does the function have a horizontal tangent line or a vertical tangent line, then it can be helpful to try and solve for y prime. Although it should be noted, you, you maybe not, won't always be able to. OK, so if I want to solve for y prime, I'll first distribute this negative, so I have minus 2xy minus x squared y prime plus 4y cubed y prime equals 0. All right, so what you do is you move everything without a y prime to the right-hand side. Then all the remaining terms on the left-hand side will have a factor of y prime, which you can pull out. So the right-hand side, I'll move over 2x, I'll add 2xy, and I'll subtract 4x cubed. The right-hand side, the remaining two terms, negative x squared y prime and 4y cubed y prime, both have a y prime, so I could factor that out. And I'll be left with 4y cubed minus x squared. Now I can solve for y prime. I just divide by 4y squared minus x, or sorry, 4y cubed minus x squared. Happy Friday. OK, so if I want to find the, tan the, um, the tangent line at negative 1, 1, I need to find the slope of the line. And that means I'll just plug in negative 1 for x and uh, 1 for y. Okay, so 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Uh, negative 1 cubed is still negative 1. So I have minus 4 times negative 1 becomes plus 4. Uh, on the denominator, 1 cubed is just, that, is just that, so I have 4. And then negative 1 squared is just 1, so I have 4 minus 1. Okay, so I get two thirds. All right, the equation of a tangent line is y minus y naught equals m times x minus x naught. where x naught, y naught are the coordinates of the point we're given originally, so the negative 1, 1, and m is the slope that we just found, 2 thirds. So you end up with y minus 1 equals 2 thirds x plus 1. Um, yeah, they're, for the tangent line, there are variables, yes. Yeah, so we're writing down the equation of a line. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I want you all to try to do the same thing for part B.
Okay, so let's look at these, or look at this one. Indeed. So you take the derivative of the left-hand side, or we just take the derivative of the whole thing. And you're using the chain rule here, all right? So sort of like my inside function is x squared plus y squared and my outside function is the squaring function. So I bring the two out front and I have x squared plus y squared and I reduce the exponent by one. So two minus one is just one. Then I multiply by the derivative of the inside. Okay, the inside is x squared plus y squared. The derivative of x squared is two x what's the derivative of y squared? Good, 2y times y prime. I probably should have mentioned that we don't really want to solve for y prime here. This would be kind of miserable. All right, so that's the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it's a product. You can think of 25 over 4 times x as um, one function and y squared as another. <laughs> okay, so the derivative of 25 over 4x is just 25 over 4. And then we leave the y squared plus 25 over 4x times the derivative of y squared, which, which we just looked at as was 2y times y prime. All right, now um, I use the chain rule on the left and the product rule on the right. And really anytime you take the derivative of, y, of a y term, you're using a chain rule. 
because I'm, I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, and y is a function of x. So it's like if I ask you what is the derivative of f of x, it's not just 1, it's f prime of x, indeed. Okay, so, so now we just plug in x equals 1 and y equals 2. All right, so I get x squared plus y squared is 1 plus 4. 2x plus 2y, y prime is 2 plus 4y prime. 25 over 4y squared is 25 over 4 times 4 plus 25 over 4, x is 1, 2y is 4. Times y prime. Okay, so let's see, the right hand side just becomes twenty five plus. 25y prime. Uh, taxes are a good thing, actually. But anyways, uh, 1 plus 4 is 5. 5 times 2 is 10. And then we distribute 10 here. So we get 10 times 2 is 20. 10 times 4 is 40. Yeah, you'll get the same answer, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And now we can solve for y prime. Okay, so let's see. I would, I can subtract 25y prime to the left-hand side, and I get 15y prime. And if I subtract 20 over to the right-hand side, I get 5. So I get y prime is 5 over 15 or one third. All right. The equation of the tangent line is then y minus two equals one third x minus one. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Y prime is the slope. Uh, yeah, you can leave your final answer in this form. Definitely.
Uh, unfortunately, no. No, there's five modules. Guys, we've been over this. I mean, you're almost done. It's the penultimate module. We do not have a final. Uh, there will be a review on Monday. Uh, Tabes is hosting a review on Monday, and I'll have office hours on Monday as well. Yes, that's that's correct, Axel. Uh, this one is three questions. The class ends next Wednesday, basically. OK, let's, let's, let's go. All right, so a rectangle initially has dimensions 2 centimeters by 4 centimeters. All sides begin increasing in length at a rate of 1 centimeter per second. At what rate is the area of the rectangle increasing after 20 seconds? <laughs> no comment on the chem department. Uh, that's correct, Josephine. Okay, so we have a rectangle. That has dimensions X and Y. And we're asking questions about, um, we're asking what the rate of change of the area is at a certain point in time. All right. So what is the area in terms of X and Y? Good. All right. So this is our function. Now for related rates, we think of, we think of like things changing in terms of time. All right. So we take the derivative of this, all of these like a, x, and y are variables that change over time, all right? So we take the derivative of this equation with respect to time. All right, the left-hand side just becomes dA over dt. So again, we're thinking of x and y as functions of time. So when I take the derivative of xy, I'm just using the product rule. So the derivative of x, I think of as just dx over dt. And I leave the y plus x times the derivative of y, which I think of as dy over dt. OK, so now I want to know what is dA over dt when t equals 20, basically, after 20 seconds, all right? So based on the information here, what, what do y'all think uh, dx over dt and dy over dt is? Just like reading the problem. Yes, it's just, they're both just one. All sides are increasing at a rate of one centimeter per second. So x and y are my sides. There's uh, basically saying x is increasing at a rate of one centimeter per second. Y is increasing at a rate of one centimeter per second. So a rate is like, a, if you hear, if you see the word rate, you should think of it as a derivative. All 
OK? So I can plug in something for dx over dt and dy over dt. I still need to plug in something for y and x. All right, so we we could like write down a function for y and a function for x, but um, and let's just like think about it. So say this the x starts at two centimeters, and the y starts at four meters. Um, like yeah, you you should kind of like put the units. At least your final answer should have some units involved. It's not like the most important thing, definitely, but. It's good practice. Um, OK, so if, if side x starts at 2 centimeters and it increases at a rate of 1 centimeter per second, what will be its side length after 20 seconds? Uh, the thing is a person, unless you mean the online thing. The online one will would would say something about like if it wants units or not. I don't think it normally asks for units. Okay. So if I start at two, if I start at two, um, yeah, tw exactly, twenty-two and twenty-four. Yeah, thank you, Gabriel and uh, Amarinda. So at at time twenty. X will be 22 and Y will be 24. So now I can plug stuff in. So dy, dx over dt is just 1. Y will be 24. X is 22. dy over dt is 1. So I get 46 centimeters squared per second. Yeah, so so it says that so for example, like it says one of the sides starts at two centimeter at length two centimeters and it increases at a rate of one centimeter per second. So after 20 seconds, it'll be it'll have increased by 20 centimeters. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah, exactly. You would use negative one. All right, so let's move on to the next one. So this says, sand falls from an overhead bin and accumulates in uh, a conical pile in such a way that the radius is always three times the height. Suppose that the height is increasing at two centimeters per second at the moment the pile is 12 centimeters high. At what rate is sand leaving the bin at this moment? Okay, so someone's pouring sand out of a bin, as so, and it's accumulating in a pile.
Aqui, aqui. Advanced pedagogy. It's asking, it's really asking a question about the rate of change of volume. It's saying at what rate is sand leaving the bin and sand leaves the bin at the same rate that it, it accumulates on the ground. Okay, so well, there's a, a, like you'll need you'll need like rates of change for the radius and height as well, like dh over t, dt or dr over dt. But we want to use the relationship between radius and height given to simplify the equation. So we have v equals one third pi r squared h. Okay, we are told that the radius is always three times the height. Okay, so I can plug this into the equation to start with before I take a derivative. So I get V is one third pi three H squared times H, which will be three pi H cubed. Three squared will give me nine, uh, which cancels with the one third to give me three. Now I can take a derivative with respect to time. Whoop. Okay, so I take the derivative of three pi h cubed, and again, you, you think of h as a function of time. The height of the pile changes as over time. All right, so what will be the derivative of 3 pi h cubed? Good, exactly. Um, I'll, you basically take the derivative of h cubed, so you bring the 3 down to get 9 pi h squared, and then you multiply according to the chain rule by the derivative of h. Okay, now we can just plug things in. Suppose the height is increasing at two centimeters per second. At the moment, the pile is 12 centimeters high. So that's telling me to like plug dh over dt is two and h is 12. So I get dv over dt is 9 pi 12 squared times 2. Okay, and this ends up being uh, 2,592 pi centimeters cubed per second. Uh, definitely leave, just leave pi in the answer, yeah. <laughs> pi is perfect the way it is. Okay, so now on to the last question. 
Um, so here that we're given basically this the idea is that this is a graph of f prime. All right, so you're going to want to answer a few, before trying to graph f, you're going to want to answer a few questions. Um, like about f. So you're, you're going to want to try to determine where it's increasing, decreasing, where does it have any local mins or maxes, so that all involves the first derivative. Then where is it concave up, concave down? And where does it have inflection points? OK. So let's just make a sign chart for f prime. All right, note that this is a graph of f prime. So if I want to know where f is increasing or decreasing, I just look at where f prime is positive or negative. So on what intervals is f prime positive? Or first, let me ask, like, where is f prime 0? OK, good. Where else? OK, there's, we're still missing one point. Yeah, seven. OK. Um, Uh, because this is five, six, seven. It seems to be like just on a coordinate axis or coordinate grid. Okay, so let's do it interval by interval. So between zero and four point eight. Yeah, so between, so uh, the graph honestly should be a little cleaner. Uh, but between 0 and 4.8, is f not, I, I'm asking a question about f, not f prime, is f increasing or decreasing? It's increasing because f prime is positive. All right, between 4.8 and 7. Would our original function f be yeah, decreasing between 7 and 10.1? Good, decreasing. And then between 10 point, sorry, 10.3 and onward? Increasing, good. Um, so I think we'll just, we'll just graph the function from zero onward. Yeah. So it's just, just to make things a little easier. All right. So a function will have a local minimum according to the first derivative test. If the derivative goes from decreasing to increasing. 
So where would the function have a local min? No, like if you look at the mins and maxes of this graph, that's not that's not like the question that we're looking for here. Yeah, so at 10.3, exactly. Okay, where would it have a local max? Good. And five would be neither. Five is a critical point, but it's neither a local min nor a local max. Okay, now let's look at concave up or down. So the points we mark here are where the first derivative um, or sorry, the points we mark here are kind of like, where would the second derivative be zero? So the second derivative is just the first derivative of this graph. So where does this graph have like horizontal tangent lines? Yeah, so, so the, again, the points aren't so clear. So let's say 2.8, um, 5.5, let's just say 8.5, so 7's right, 7 is one of them, so we'd have like 2.8, 5.5, 7, and 8.5. Yep, 7 works too. So 7 is a 0 of the first and second derivative, basically. So it's um, a critical point, and it may be an inflection point. All right, so is f double prime positive between 0 and 2.8, or is it negative? Good. So now we're looking at this at the graph and just seeing if the graph is increasing or decreasing, right? So between 2.8 and 5.5, the graph itself is decreasing. Between 5.5 and 7, the graph itself is increasing. Between 7 and 8.5, the graph is decreasing. And between 8.5 onward, the graph is increasing. So these are the intervals um, yeah we'll take we'll take the the domain to go from like zero to infinity. <laughs> so these are the intervals on which the function is concave up and concave down. It's concave up if the second derivative is positive and concave down if it's negative. So a function will have an inflection point. if the concavity changes signs. So where does the concavity change signs? Yeah, at, at all of these points, basically, right? It goes positive, negative, positive, negative, positive. So I'm always changing signs over all these points. So they're all inflection points. It, seven is as seven is because it's the second derivative changes signs there. The second derivative still goes from positive to negative. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now let's graph this. So you basically like you kind of want to look at all the points that are marked on either of these graphs. So I've got two point eight. Uh, 4.8, 7, 8.5, and 
Okay. All right. So we are told like a starting point. We're told that f of zero is zero. All right. So our graph starts here. All right. Now we just now we just look at like each like the intervals here. So from zero to two point eight, my function is concave up. And on that same interval, the first derivative, like concave up and increasing. All right, from 2.8 to say 4.8, the function is concave down and still increasing. So this is an inflection point. All right. From 4.8 to 5.5, the function will be decreasing and concave down. Then from 5.5 to 7, the function will be concave up and decreasing, indeed. All right, from 7 to 8.5, the function will be concave down and decreasing. And then from 8.5 to 10.3, the function will be concave up and decreasing. And then finally, from 10.3 onward, the function is concave up and increasing. So we have an inflection point. a max, another inflection point, another inflection point, another inflection point, and a min. Yeah, it doesn't have to cross the x-axis. Um, so whether or not the second derivative is positive or negative. Mm -hmm. Yes, concave up is U-shaped, concave down is downward U-shaped. <laughs> uh, no, but I think it's helpful. OK, comrades, it's, it's been an honor to serve with you. Thanks for sticking with me this semester. Um, that'll be all. Good luck with the modules and your future academic careers. Maybe we'll meet again. Stay safe, indeed. <laughs> Thank y'all. See what I can do. Please, please remember to fill out the course evaluations as well. Uh, yeah, I'll have office hours on Monday from four to five. Oh, um, that's a good question, Lauren. I'm I'm not sure. It will be online. So there is that. Um, I'm not sure how they're going to handle that. No, thank you. I wouldn't mind.
stocks. Thanks for all. Of, thanks to all of my LAs as well, uh, Milo, Strio, and Howard. You all have been great. Uh, there is. It's called differential equations. Real analysis is the is the real programmer move. Yeah, good luck, Milas. <laughs>